Hello and welcome to Newspeak, New Culture Forum's weekly look at the news agenda uh, with, as usual, I'm pleased to say, Rafe Hadelman Koo, Senior Fellow and Royal Commentator, and Amy Gallagher, who is the SDP's candidate for the London mayoralty and a campaigner for Stand Up to Woke. Uh, we are looking at a number of different issues uh, this week. We're starting with what appears to be a kind of mini implosion uh, of Labour, in particular around the forthcoming Rochdale by-election. Um, Rafe, uh, with this situation where in fact they've effectively withdrawn their support from their Labour candidate because of what he said about Israel, they, he's still on the ballot this guy, so Azur Ali, I think his name is, and uh, he's still on because he has to be at this stage. Um, but I just wondered, when you look at like Labour going down by seven points, is this because it's just finally being revealed to people that Labour have got a serious ongoing problem with this issue? No, I mean that's one of the contributing factors. The, the other one is this U-turn that Stam has done on the £28 billion pounds of, of green funding and the, the, the amount of capital that the Tories and others have made out of this embarrassing Starmer, yet again somebody who doesn't really know or have a plan for the future, that seems to be uh, breaking through with the public as well. So it's a variety of factors, but certainly um, aided and abetted by this appalling re resurgence or reminder, I should say, it's always been festering under the surface, mm -hmm. this reminder to the public that the Labour Party hasn't changed its spots, it, it still has a deeply anti-Semitic streak running through it, and we've, we've actually seen a good portrayal of that because it's not just this uh, Ali chap, uh, it's also Graham Jones, another person. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are, I, I suppose, they are the poster boys for the Venn diagram of the anti-Semitism that that's the core. You've got the Muslim anti-Semitic radicals and you have the far left radical whites, whites all who have this shared uh, hatred of uh, Israel and, uh, and um, of, 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 of Jews in general, it seems, from, the, from what we can see. Um, now, of course, we have this bizarre situation as a result of that, where Labour don't have a candidate in this, uh, in, in this by-election, and yet three of the people standing are Labour men, right? You had George Galloway, a former Labour MP, now standing in election there, mm. Simon Danchuk, former Labour MP for the area, now Reform Party candidate, and Ali now, who is on the ticket but isn't, isn't going to be representing the Labour Party, and interestingly he's just come out now with his own new branded poster, not in the red but in green, um, saying Starmer kicked me out for basically for telling the truth about Israel. So sh showing his true colours and that the apology that he uh, he gave was really was was really insincere. Um, and so we'll see whether it has an effect. I think really all this does is it opens the door further for George Galloway. Mm. So I would be very surprised if we don't see um, gorgeous George returning to Parliament. Well, that will be sort of nothing absolutely new, will it? I mean, he's he actually got in on the back of that kind of vote, I think, was in, in the East End in London uh, some years ago now. I mean, extraordinary, this guy, you know, he just won't, you know, lay down. Mm. Um, but. I mean, what, what do you think, what does this more widely show? I mean, when I looked at it, I sort of think, this guy was sort of found out for these extraordinary conspiracy theories, this mm. Ali guy. Mm. Um, uh, in fact, it's just un unbelievable that he said, you know, Israel effectively ki would kill its own people, allowed its own people mm. to be killed so that it could invade Gaza. Um, this is like a, form of emerging sectarianism isn't it in a way yeah that's right and then he after saying that he later then made a comment about the Jewish media you know yeah. using sort of anti-semitic tropes of the Jews being in charge of the media and so on I mean this is going to be a growing you know divisive issue for the Labour Party I mean it always has been but as Ray said the Venn diagram between Muslim radicals and the far left is they actually don't have that much in common apart from you know mm. th this anti-semitism um, the la you know the Labour left like to um, back Muslims because they're you know an ethnic minority and so on but actually they're often very conservative I mean several years ago we saw in Jess Phillips constituency where Muslims were um, protesting against LGBT mm. um, being taught in school, and it was, you know, it was very difficult for the Labour to know, for Labour to know which side to um, back. Um, we've seen, you know, I mean, the La Labour Party were um, were investigated by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, and in 2020, the report found that there there was anti-Semitism in the party. Um, there was issued an, an, an unlawful act notice, and they were put under special measures. We don't quite know what it was that they agreed to, yes. but we know that they agreed to something. Uh, it would be, I guess, being more 
um, you're, you're cracking down on anti-Semitism. But we've seen uh, actually rec in recent years, it seems that Keir Starmer's Labour Party is, if anything, just as anti-Semitic, if not more than, than Corbyn was. I mean, Corbyn always denied anti-Semitism when we didn't see it so so overtly as we do now. So the idea that, that it in any way has gone away, in fact, it may well be that they've breached the Equalities and Human Rights Commission laws. Um, and when we saw, and we saw last year as well, Diane Abbott writing into The Guardian saying that Jews can't experience racism. This is a, this is a big thing. It's not isolated incidents. Um, and it's only going to get bigger. I, I mean, I think like radical Muslims are essentially using the left. Um, and as they get bigger, they, you know, they will, you know, like, like with this Azir Ali, they'll end up going independent and discarding Labour when they no longer need well, there is There is, isn't there, this new movement called the Muslim Vote, which is like nascent. You think this is a beginning of something. But when you talk about that, you see, uh, about the um, Muslims using the left, I'd also say it's the left using the Muslims. But I've, I've always thought it's that more. You think uh, Nick... Cohen wrote a book all about this thing called What's Left. This has been bubbling away for 20 years? For a long, long time, but I think the left should be far more fearful of being used by the Muslim right. I always refer always to the Iranian Revolution, right, mm -hmm. where the, you had this unholy alliance between the uh, Ayatollah and the radical uh, Muslims and the university students of the left. And of course, they combined forces to overthrow the Shah and as soon as the the, the, the Muslims uh, the, the Islamic uh, Republic was declared all of the youth were suppressed of course brutally suppressed and uh, we know full well of course that you know that the, the uh, Muslims loathe the LGBT movement and they, they, they loathe all of the the, the the principles and concepts of the left and so there's, that's, a, that's a marriage of convenience and the stronger the stronger that they get I think the more oppressive we'll see them within those constituencies. Yeah. Um, but you know, but the sectarianism you, you refer to actually is interesting because Keir Starmer has been very quick to um, defenestrate anyone on the far left of his party who expresses an anti-Semitic view. This Ali guy was very close to Keir Starmer's side of the party. Mm -hmm. He was a party faithful member as far as Keir Starmer was concerned. And that's why he allowed him so much more leeway. He accepted the apology, whereas I doubt he would have accepted the apology from a Diana Abbott type of no, character. Yeah. And so it just goes to show that even Starmer has a tolerance for anti-Semitism, uh, so long as it suits his own political ends. But there's a much more profound point here, which I don't think people fully understand. You know, um, the Labour Party is heavily dependent on the Muslim vote in lots of these constituencies. And the Muslim vote, as you say, are th th these voters are very angered by Labour's stance over Gaza. What that means is that once Labour comes to power, they're going to do everything they can to appease their the Muslim voters. That means we can probably expect draconian steps done to uh, basically implement, for example, a blasphemy law, as we've discussed on this channel mm -hmm. in the past, mm -hmm. using this APPG definition of Islamophobia, and it will mean all sorts of appeasement tactics to try to placate the radical mm -hmm. Muslim vote. And I think we need to be very alert and aware of that and quite uh, afraid. Yeah. yeah, what I think is interesting as well about this is that, you know, if you go right back to when, to, to, the, to the beginnings of mass migration under Blair, you know, there's this famous thing where Andrew, ne Andrew Nether said, speechwriter said, we're going to make sure that, you know, we're going to rub the right's nose in diversity. It's kind of blown up in their face, mm. actually. It's a yeah. mix of metaphor, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, particularly over this Israel-Palestine Israel issue, and that actually when we had the vote about the ceasefire last year, actually it was also it was almost the Labour MPs that were getting more stick for yeah. the way they voted or whether they abstained from the vote from Palestinian protesters than, than the, the, the Conservative Party were that there was a real anger f towards the Labour Party yeah so there's some footage last year of um, Angela Rayner giving a speech um, to a constituency which was en interrupted by pro-Palestinian uh, activist claiming she wasn't a real feminist, she hadn't done enough to stand up to the, for the Palestinian cause. So this issue is going to divide the Labour Party more and more. Um, and it, it, you know, it, as you say, it's going to backfire. Mm. Um, I think, you know, it's uh, also as we speak today, we're recording this on the Wednesday, um, there was a report out showing that anti-Semitism, when it comes to attacks, um, is up at a 40 year high mm. an extraordinary amount like 4,800 I think attacks I mean this is the kind of thing that the media dances around I suspect that they, they are not attacks by white left-wing students I would have thought that that's straight up 
Muslim attacks on Jews in mm. places like London. Yeah, not straight out Muslim. There are some. There are some um, blacks who are involved in that too. But there are also you do get some, some. Some students are involved in that to some degree. Maybe maybe not physical, but name calling. And you know, we've seen that with the ripping down of posters. But it's basically it's it's, it's the left who are uh, and 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 these Muslims are doing it. And it's shameful to think. In twenty, I never thought we would be seeing the scenes that we saw recently in twenty first century Britain. You know, I remember as a, as a student in high school watching footage. Of the uh, of the crystal nacht and so forth in Germany, where you had you know stars of David painted on windows and walls, and I remember thinking, gosh, imagine that sort of a society. And actually, we're experiencing things just akin to that now. When you see the graffiti that's being daubed in places, and uh, Jewish businesses being being attacked and so and swarmed, I mean, it's it's chilling. Mm. It's, it's chilling, but I mean, I you know I take your point, but just common sense alone tells you that. You're going to have a rise in anti-Semitism if you have a rise in the Muslim population. I well, mean, just look at the centres of this, right? It's not happening in the Cotswolds, is it? No, no. This, is, this is happening in London, it's happening in Birmingham, in <laughs> Leeds, Bradford, Scott in Burnley, 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 in Leeds. It's yeah. happening in, in all of the centres. And it's, 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 as I said, met for the last, few, <coughs> for the last few years, you know, the rise in anti-Semitism, misogyny and homophobia in London has happened at the same time that you've had the white British population declining. That's not a coincidence. Yes. It's interesting that certain things also could have come into light. I saw a tweet yesterday, I don't know how, how far it's got, but uh, one of the contestants currently on The Apprentice has said some really pretty mm. rough things and talking about how Zionists all look ugly or something. It's obvious he means Jewish people. Do you know what I mean? It's just so obvious. Now, he somehow got past the BBC's due diligence, didn't he? Yeah, it's, it's very concerning how this is entering the mainstream. I mean, and, and, and you know, if you're talking about Jews, I mean, Jews are a minority in, in relation to Muslims. They're a minority in London, but they're a minority uh, uh, yeah. nationally in relation to Muslims. And all the less rhetoric about, you know, um, representing minorities and in, in the face of majority power, that is completely absent with, with this group. Um, and as you say, it's, it, when you're seeing it entering the mainstream, that would be the time when people to really you know, crack down, particularly organisations like the BBC. Yes. Um, but it's, it's not happening. I think you could be sure, could you not, that if one of those contestants, they must go through all their social media with a fine tooth comb. Mm. If they had said, if you have one of them saying something like, uh, a woman is obviously an adult female human. Yeah. <laughs> or if someone had even said something vaguely anti-immigration, mm. out they would have gone. Mm. This is what I wonder, because people said, well, the BBC weren't made aware of this until it was pointed out to them after the fact. And I thought, really? Surely in this day and age they do go through. So either somebody was incompetent, or they saw that and they saw nothing wrong with him making those comments. That didn't flag up, which I think speaks to the bigger issue at the BBC. And yet the series, they said if we had known this at the time, he wouldn't have been allowed to take part. But they're, st they're still currently airing this series, I suppose, at the moment, yeah. which, you know, I suppose maybe it's too expensive to pull the whole thing. But I hope discussions were had around that subject. Actually, yes. Actually, you no, know, it all sort of like kind of falls into place in a kind of cockeyed way. But, you know, when we talked recently about this young scheduler from BBC Three mm -hmm. and this thing, she said, well, she's a scheduler. So she's like a producer, you know, long term producer. Uh, so there you, there you have it. You, mm. If you have people like that doing due diligence, they're going to sort of maybe let it go. On this point as well, isn't it also, you say this is very worrying about entering the mainstream, yes, but it almost looks like it's entering our judiciary. You know, we've actually had this case this week where the girls who went to one of the demonstrations with those pictures of hang gliders, which is a form of a terrorist, uh, well, it was the way in which the terrorists attacked, mm happened with Hamas, um, they were kind of not punished, weren't they, by a judge who's been much more virulent in other areas. Yeah, they were found guilty of, of yeah. uh, I believe it was a hate, a hate crime or a yeah. hate incident, but his re rationale for letting them off was that, oh, tensions were running high or, or something along those descriptions, you know, it was an emotional subject matter. Um, so this is a very subjective, you know, response yeah. to, to, you know, a hate crime, and you wouldn't get that, that same response to, to other, to, in other areas. Well, she's given a harsher penalty for people for tweets that they've yes. sent out, yeah. for example, exactly. and you yes. think, well, if you weigh, weigh those two, clearly one is more serious than the other. A WhatsApp message, actually, oh. not even a tweet, mm. a WhatsApp message. Anyway, we could all instead go into the land of the Prime Minister where none of this <laughs> is happening. Yeah. Um, if you saw uh, on GB News, he did, uh, which obviously is quite a coup for GB News, he did this People's Forum this week. Um, and uh, there he was 
uh, walking around very sort of I felt in a very kind of almost a slightly a, a throwback way you know without a jacket walking around with the mic on his back looking sort of dynamic dynamic um, didn't it strike you that none of the issues that we've kind of even covered like within the past 10 minutes mm -hmm. came up did they no I mean he, he focused mostly on the economy inflation and, and so on and the NHS a bit I mean, he, he keeps going on about the small boats. I mean, I don't know why, I mean, that's not even a, a win. He hasn't, Rwanda hasn't, it's not necessarily gonna work and it hasn't gone through yet. So I don't yeah. even know, even, or, even on the issues he was discussing, it wasn't like there were great topics for the Conservative Party to be proud of. But I think that the, the issues that most people are concerned about is, is the cultural shift in terms of woke ideology and the, the long march through the institutions that has happened under the Tories um, and immigration. Mm -hmm. And those are the two big things mm -hmm. that he would absolutely should be addressing more than anything. But he won't because he knows that, well, they're fouled on, on both of those issues. I mean, people say, oh, well, he was being asked questions, but any leader worth their while will make sure they say those things, won't they? Yeah, well, what we know from the public, it's, he it's healthy economy and immigration, right? These are the mm. three most important issues. And the fact that, you know, he simply doesn't understand the public's concern about immigration. You know, he said, judge me on my five pledges, and even went on, on Piers Morgan to discuss that, right? It was reduce the debt. Um, halve inflation, get the economy growing, uh, NHS waiting list, and stop the boats. Mm -hmm. He didn't even include legal. He should have said immigration, legal and illegal, mm -hmm. as the fifth pledge. Just talking about boats, it was only in the last few months, you know, last year, suddenly immigration became a hot topic in the media, and suddenly he said, oh, yes, we'll deal with it. The reason he didn't discuss it was because there's absolutely no, nothing he can say that would excuse Tory party policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been, you know, forget Labour. Remember when we used to get exercise about Labour? It's double or three times whatever it is under, under the Tories as it was under Labour, far worse under an alleged Tory government. And of course, they're, they're bringing in people who aren't going to be voting Tories. So I've got, it's quite, you know, befuddles me why they think this is a, a, a good pro program for Britain. But um, I just think, I just, I just found the whole, the, whole in, the whole debate, the whole discussion he had completely out of touch with the needs of mm. GB News viewers. Yes, exactly. It was kind of strange in that way, wasn't it? There was uh, talk about, you know, VAT on private schools. I mean, minor, mm. minor stuff. Yes. But what, what, what sort of struck me about the format is that I imagine that GB News, and, you know, understandable, are really sort of pleased to have got him. And they want to have Keir Starmer. But you should allow the people who make questions uh, to, to have a comeback. And say sorry but you haven't answered my question but they didn't they all rather obediently sat down didn't they yeah and you saw that that rishi sinak's responses were very i mean i just find they're very middle management yeah. they're very just sort of giving the, the least controversial answer in order so that he doesn't have a kind of headline or something it's very um i find him to be very uh, inauthentic his answers are very calculated um he's also quite awkward i find it mm. difficult to connect with him is just something about him that you just you, you don't feel like you're getting to know him you you're, you're just dealing with a politician that there's yes. nothing there that you you can connect with um yeah i i, I just yeah I, f I found the whole thing to be um yeah he wasn't challenged enough and like i said when he was challenged he just sort of wriggled out of things but mm. didn't give any answers that you really thought right yes he's he's got it you know well, what i was quite astonished by though was after that uh, um, interview took place that gb news did a poll and 50% of its viewers said that they would vote for the Conservative Party after the Sunex performance. Was it viewers? I thought it was just people in the audience. Or maybe in the audience, yeah. but I just found Even that just, so. yeah, I just <laughs> found that <laughs> astonishing. Yeah. I, just well, thought, I mean, yeah. it's a Conservative, uh, you know, news network. So. Yeah, but you, the, the feeling I've always <laughs> yeah. had is that it's, it, is that you know, well, half half the people that appear on it are. But the feeling you get is that it's much more in line with reform, mm. and that there's mm. such despondency mm. about the Tory Party's performance. And of course, a lot of red wall voters who feel betrayed, who will be giving their vote to Labour, who are still small C Conservatives. I found that quite, quite remarkable. Mm. Yes, it did have the feeling, didn't it, of like kicking off the election. Mm. Uh, but the latest report, which is, I think is in the Times and Telegraph today again, is saying that they could be, they could be in for the worst result in their history, i.e. down to 80 seats. 245 for Labour, or something like that. Yes. A 80 seats, is which amazing, is such a huge swing from the 80 seat majority yeah. that they got. There was a complete lack of n knowledge or, or ad admission of the way life is being lived on the ground, I think. Um, speaking of which, um, something caught my eye. It's been one of my preoccupations, I have to say, uh, to, to be egotistical about it, is um, 
the growing level of incivility generally in the country. Madeleine Grant wrote a piece about this in The Telegraph. These are the kind of things that politicians won't on the whole ever talk about because it means that they've got to make some form of value judgment and they, they just will not do this kind of thing. Um, but she was talking about the way in which people are behaving, particularly on public transport. It does appear to me to be a flashpoint. And still there is this kind of attitude that persists that somehow or other we're too reticent to say anything. I think it's downright fear, isn't it? Wouldn't you say? You don't want to go and sort of basically challenge someone who you think might knife you. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was on a train a few months ago and there were maybe three of us in the carriage and one young chap was playing his stereo very loudly um, and so I went to tell him to turn it down. Now I'm a large intimidating sort of a character but if he had a knife or something you know what use is yeah, that? Yeah. And then I thought would I would that actually I thought as I was approaching him I was thinking is this a good idea? Yeah. Um, and then I sat down again. Now I wouldn't have that sort of thought if I was talking to a, a middle-aged man no, or a no. woman or something so there's absolutely an element there's both of those things right there's that English um, desire not to be polite at all times but there's also uh, a fear here and it's also the fact that you can't rely on the authorities to do anything and it also all of our institutions you remember, do you remember the days when all of the railway staff were properly uniformed mm -hmm. your park keeper was properly uniformed the postman were you know there was a sense of authority in these in these figures and there was a respect and a deference that came from from their positions that they held all of that's now gone and it's also it's about culture right when the, the more ethnic diversity we have the lower trust levels are so it's interesting to compare for example london to liverpool i was on this on the, the, the metro system in liverpool and i didn't know where i was going so i went to look at the map and three people got out of their seats to come to me to ask if i needed help yes and i thought that would never happen mm -hmm. and that's because that's liverpool is still a very homogenous culture where even the the hotel staff are all for liverpudlians even the homeless people are liverpudlians and therefore they, they have that same sense of values and, and shared belief system which we've lost in major cities like London and Birmingham. Do you find that you avoid the public space now? I mean this is what we're talking yes. about. Yes, a little bit in London. If I can walk rather than take the tube now I will. But I, I think the, the basic uh, incivility, I mean it's happening more in London than it is elsewhere. We are increasingly atomised and there's a real kind of hostile, almost dog-eat-dog -dog, uh, mm. <laughs> kind of tone when you're getting on pu public transport. And, you know, like basic things like loudspeakers, that could be something that Sadiq Khan could do something about. Mm. He does all these ad campaigns about, um, you know, about behaviour on the tubes, but it's always kind of from a woke perspective. So he puts up posters just saying, be kind or um, you know, posters about sexism, which really don't do much and they're not enforced. You know, so what's the purpose of mm. a poster that says be kind? It's, it, no one's gonna look at that and think, oh, okay, I'll be kind then. You know, with things like loudspeakers, you could do an ad campaign about antisocial behavior yeah. on the tube and it would be enforced. That's the, that's the thing that would have to happen, that you would actually see visibly people being pulled up and then people would get says we saw it with i mean with the covid pandemic i mean uh, that to me was a a mm. campaign that really did change mm. people's behavior on mm. on on traveling everyone was wearing masks everybody sat separate from each other very quickly because there was this strong campaign to get people to do so and you could do that around antisocial behavior but instead sadiq khan is you know putting up these virtue signaling um, platitudes which don't do anything i think that's a very good point actually because you see i was about to say that the one the thing that are you have to start doing regulations about like speakers uh, where peer pressure has essentially gone you know mm. we wouldn't have had to like putting dirty feet up on the seas I, it's something that drives me crazy mm. right um basically to me it's the absolute you know obliviousness uh, nihilism in that um, but now you do see signs saying please do not do this once upon a time pff, probably people would have said excuse me do you mind not putting your feet there but I think there is this fear but also lack of total lack of peer peer pressure now with these things um, it's a kind of sort of breakdown even in queuing dare, dare I say it, people say oh new culture forum going on about queuing or well, I haven't seen a queue at a London bus stop in central London for a long oh, time it just doesn't years. happen any longer not for years, no. at all but you can't blame people if they come from different cultures where that's not actually the practice you see it also with, with, with littering on public transport, for example, because you know you just have to look at the streets of Nairobi and Delhi. And people just naturally litter. It's part of their culture. That they were never the whole Keep Britain Tidy scheme never went out to, to Mombasa. You know, mm. I mean, I don't. I think it's sort of there's something kind of a bit typical. 
new culture forum going on about how queuing has disappeared. But the fact is, queuing to me is the most wonderful example, isn't it, of social cohesion. And actually, it's a great symbol. When that goes, it means social cohesion has sort of gone. But that, that requires a knowledge and understanding of cultural values and norms and, and a common culture. And I haven't seen a proper bus queue in London, for mm. example, for, for for years, I can't see, mm -hmm. and you know, and then again, and the, these characteristics occur also on public transport. Uh, you know, the, the number amount of litter that you now see in, in public transport is because people are coming from cultures where they they don't have recycling bins and trash cans and so forth. And so, if you go to places like Nairobi and Delhi, you will see the rubbish on the streets, and that's been in, in, tra uh, in, imported into Britain. Same thing with people speaking very loudly on speakerphones to their friends yeah. because in their cultures they they naturally just speak more loudly. It's a cultural thing. You know, we we find that it's Americans speak loudly. Well, the same applies to people from from other parts of the world. And this and it's those little things on your on the day to day level that cause cultural tensions to rise up. And nobody in London or in Britain is actually teaching or trying to do anything to integrate people and say, this is Britain, this is how we conduct ourselves in Britain. Mm. Well, I think it, your point about the queuing, and one, one thing about the Queen's uh, funeral was that the, the big the queue that was queuing, yeah, yes. and everybody was so proud and excited to be in a queue, because I think it probably yes. did tap into a, an aspect of British culture that we are proud of, that mm. we queue, mm. and um, we, we wait, and we're patient, and mm. we stay in line. Um, and that was that one event, but you know, you don't, like you say, you don't see it at bus stops or on, on train stops anymore. Or indeed in cinemas. Mm. I mean, or, I mean, there were these uh, complaints that come in every so often now about theatre audiences not knowing the, what they call the etiquette of theatres. Uh, what it seems to me is, uh, what, what, the only thing I would, I would slightly, slightly disagree with you, Ref, or maybe I'm not disagreeing with you, is that um, you say about other cultures, at least in my experience, um, it has been like, you know, indigenous people speaking incredibly loudly, swearing, having the most extraordinary personal kind of conversations on their phone in front of everyone. You sort of think, where's your shame? Where's your pride? You know, and with cinemas, uh, people look at it as though they're watching something in their own home, don't they? Yeah, you're absolutely right. But shame is another, it's the, the, the loss of shame. I mean, there are many different factors here. I'm talking about London because London is such a big melting pot. But yes, more broadly, it was, these are the same people who go on these reality TV shows or have no shame in posting things on Twitter, you know, all these selfies that they, mm. they pose of their rear end and so forth. So this is the culture we're in. And, you know, it's schools are where this stuff, if parents aren't doing it, you know, I mean, when I was at school, we would basically taught manners as part of the natural uh, school process. All of that's gone. You know, make sure your shoes are right, your tie is straight. You see the kids today, their ties are all over the place. There's, there, there's a complete lack of self-respect. And the irony here is everyone is so focused now upon being disrespected. We live this sort of mm. honor culture amongst the youth you've disrespected me, whereas they show no respect to the infrastructure of cities, to other people, or to codes, to codes of behavior. Uh, and you know, David Starkey said something years ago that got him into trouble on Question Time when he said that one of the reasons that the white culture is going downhill so fast in, the, in council states, working class, is because of black gangster culture. And that's where this sort of notion of disrespect arose from. So there's a lot of, a lot of different aspects to this. Yes. Well, one thing actually as well, while we're on the subject of public transport. Today it's been announced that uh, by presumably the Mayor of London uh, that there are six new uh, names for tube lines in London and frankly it's made people incandescent on social media mm. for reasons I entirely understand when you look at the titles. One of them is Windrush, right? Mm. These are being imposed are they not? The others, do you remember the others? Yeah, so one of them was the suffragette line. Yes, yeah, suffragette line. Um, suffragette line, line as, you know, which were a, a political movement that, essentially, that they advocated for violence yeah. to, to, to achieve political means. Yeah. They were quite an extremist part of the broader feminist movement. Yes. Um, and of course, they're, they're all political. You know, why do they have to be political? Why does that? Do, and there's the lionesses. To now, this is presumably about the female British football team. Yes, you know. yeah, which is a relatively new thing. They won the mm. European. Um, uh, football uh, several years ago, but they, yeah. they, you know, the lionesses was the sort of tabloid name for them. Mm. Um, th it seems to be very short-termist, you know, it's very f the kind of the fashions at the moment. And as I said, all political, all about identity politics. Yeah. And you know, you, you could just think of names that are completely neutral. You could have names about flowers or nature or, or anything like that. Or you could celebrate British, you know, British people. Maybe you could have a, the Beatles line for the, the band or someone that we all, we, you know, people that are admired or liked 
in some ways. But why does it have to be group political groups or, or things are based around identity? Or why can't it actually be place names? Who yes, say? yes. Well, we know why because this is life in post-revolutionary Britain. You know, I just tweeted about this. This is what the, the Politburo, the Commissariat do when they have a revolution, is they rename streets, they rename uh, underground railway stations, train lines yeah. with the new ideology, the new myths and the new heroes. And that's what we have here. And quite frankly, it's, uh, I think it's absurd for someone to say, I'm going to go and jump on the suffragette. You know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Who's going to yeah, say yeah, that? Yeah, Where you exactly. say, I'll jump on the Baker Lude line or whatever. You know, there's, there's a complete nonsense there. And, you know, and, and uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Khan is constantly accusing the right of stoking the culture wars, mm -hmm. but yet he's using every tool at his disposal mm -hmm. to foist upon London this new cultural orthodoxy of his, and it's a top-down culture. Culture is supposed to emanate from the yeah. ground up. Yeah. You know, this is come, this is an, an enforced culture that's being imp imposed on the country, and I think it's very different. You know, and I think you know, I think he's, he would like to be the the mayor that takes us from net zero to year zero, yeah. and we're getting closer to this idea of a year zero where we have a complete. Uh, rewashing re of the past, claiming that the entire nation was built by immigrants, for example. Yes, it, it, it's got a very strong Soviet feel about it, hasn't it? You know? Yeah, I mean, firstly, it's going to cost six million. You know, uh, it's, it's extremely costly. And it seems to have just come out of nowhere. We were, no, were, were we ever asked about this? Was there any discussion? You know, who's mm -hmm. come up with these names and how would they come up with? And, well, he, you know, Khan's just announcing this just before the elections. I mean, it's interesting, you know, because they don't also spend a huge bunch of money on London Bridge Station with all the different pride flags. Yes. I think there are about 100 of these flags on them and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, all that money, I would like to actually see one person of st staff brought onto these new trains that have no carriage, just mm -hmm. one single carriage, mm -hmm. and they could enforce the policies and the regulations about speakers and so forth. They can now walk through the entire length of the train. Why can't we have mm -hmm. that? Yes, I think it's, it's, it is all of a piece, isn't it, with Khan? You know, he did after all, take no time at all in introducing this review of statues, review of street names. You know, it's about, as you say, imposing, uh, imposing yeah. from the top. And it sort of, it is so, makes you so angry because in fact, you've got to say the words. Mm. You know, you've got to say this after like, or the Windrush light or anything like that. Individually, we might admire the suffragettes or we might, you know, whatever, feel what we do about Windrush. But the fact is, it's being done to us whether we like it or not. That's a crucial thing. It's, it's like you see these zebra crossings now that have got the pride flag on it, you know. And exactly. you just think, why? You know, this should be just purely functional. There should yeah. be no message. No, yes. no, you know. And it's a, it's confusing because some people don't even know what it is. Horses hate it. Yes, well, that as well. And and as you say, it mean, it just brings the political into every turn, mm. every every road you go down. You, you're presented with some kind of message. That's yeah. precisely the point. There is no escaping the messaging. Mm. Wherever you turn mm. now, the message is there. This yeah. is the next level of propagandizing and brainwashing. So you can't even take the train now. And then you sit, so you're on the Windrush line, then you sit in the train and you look up and there you've got the mayor's poems accusing, you know, about mm. white privilege, about the evils of empire and so mm. forth. Mm. It's, a, it's an insidious way to try to basically transform a culture and a society. Interestingly, actually though, but it, the public transport usage has not actually ever quite reached pre-pandemic you know, um, uh, levels. I, I think it's partly because people now work at home, certainly in London uh, is the case. But also, it really goes back to what we were saying, wasn't it? That there's a sort of feeling that you avoid things if you can, you know, if you can just avoid things because it's just so unpleasant now, you know, anyways. Anyway, so there we go. Straight On that happy note. <laughs> On that happy note, sorry. But I mean, it's the truth, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you, you know, what? one can't be Pollyannish about this. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you very much, Rafe. And uh, we shall see you next week. Uh, so please, in the meantime, have a lovely week, won't you? OK, bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, 
and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.